Good evening and welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Live Irish Myths, episode number 149. You're all very welcome this evening. It's been a lovely, bright and sunny and warm day here in the Boyne Valley. I hope it is likewise for you, wherever you are in the world, wherever you're tuning in from this evening, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Please, if you are uh, joining us, feel free to uh, comment on the live stream. We are streaming simultaneously on YouTube, on the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel, also on the Mythical Ireland Facebook page and on the Mythical Ireland community on uh, Facebook. Last week, we branched out a little bit from talking exclusively about Irish mythology to speak about the works, the work of the uh, the great, the late great uh, Swiss psychoanalyst, uh, Carl Gustav Jung. That was intended to be one episode, but in fact, it seems that people really enjoyed it. And I didn't get to talk about the book that I really wanted to talk about, uh, written by Jung, which is Answer to Job, which I'm going to uh, hopefully talk about tonight. How does this relate to Irish mythology? The best answer I can give you to that is it doesn't really directly relate, but uh, given the propensity for people who are involved in the study or you know, even the study of mythology or even an interest in mythology and folklore uh, to gravitate towards the works of C.G. Young uh, cannot go unnoticed. And indeed, uh, that prompts a more wide ranging discussion about the meaning of mythology, something that I think a, a Jungian uh, disciple or uh, avid follower, uh, Joseph Campbell, um, latched onto quite considerably in his own work uh, spanning decades. If you're joining us, uh, as I say, on the Mythical Ireland community, your name may not appear in the comments here, so I will have to cross check as we go along. Anyway, a very good evening, first and foremost, to Joe Butler, who's in a hot and dry Colorado. So it sounds like Colorado and the Boyne Valley have something in common this evening. You're very welcome, Joe. Movanway Millward says that this should be a fascinating live stream. I hope indeed that it is, um, fingers crossed. Greetings, my friends, says Archaeoastronomy Database. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, Robin Rickman is in the house. Hello, Robin. Very good evening to you. Good afternoon. Uh, Mandy McCurl says it's dull and misty in the Isle of Mull. I am sorry to hear that. I hope at least that it is mild, but you're very welcome. Make yourself feel at home. Drag up, drag up a stool or a chair or an armchair or a recliner or a deck chair, whatever you happen to have handy. Make yourself a brew or a dram. For the record, tonight my drink is water and it's water from the Boyne. Um, who else have we got? Dol Mac McDermott says, hello, Tua and Anthony. Hello to you. Very uh, good to see you and you're welcome. Lillian Cruz is in the house. Slauncha Lillian. Barbara Murphy is in Tucson, Arizona, where I, I'm imagining the weather is pretty good. Probably doesn't need to even be mentioned. You're very welcome, Lillian. Facebook user says, hi, Anthony. Hi, hi everyone. That is Barbara Barney on the Mythical Ireland community. Hello, Barbara. Welcome along to this evening's live stream. Hope you enjoy it. Elaine Dent, Dent Lingenfelter says it's 35 Celsius in Texas, which is 95 Fahrenheit. Happy Labor Day to our friends in the US. Yes, indeed. Many happy returns. Happy Labor Day to all the viewers from the United States this evening. Anne McCallum, who's in Canada, says hello, Anthony and the mighty Tua de Anton. Uh, de, even. Hello. Hope everyone is well. Glad to be here. Always a pleasure to have you in the house, Anne. In the Mythical Ireland Library. Erica Rivertree is in Louisville, Kentucky. Cain Chui Oiltu. Ah, Chua. August Tussafain. Uh, what's the weather like in Louisville? I hope it's uh, hope it's good. Jules Cousins is in the house and says hello to everybody. Hello, Jules. Helena Breen likewise is saying hello to everyone. Uh, Falcha. Jim Conway uh, suggests that Jung was a great fan of uh, George William Russell's work, AE, and didn't know that specifically, uh, Jim, but uh, delighted to hear it, actually. Thank you for filling us in on that. This is Desiree Riley who says, Hi everyone, I love all you guys. Thank you for all your love and prayers. Me and my family made it through the hurricane okay. 
and now they're visiting me in Colorado, currently at a wine tasting with them, so I'll have to catch up later. Well, I tell you, if you're going to forgive yourself and excuse yourself on live Irish myths, what better excuse do you need than to be at a live, sorry, at a wine tasting? Sounds good. Enjoy it. Have a sup of Pinot Grigio on me. There's a fellow in a wine shop and the wine merchant is telling him that a wine has been developed from a special grape and uh, you can drink as much of it as you like and you won't have to go to the lavatory. He said it's called Pinot More. <laughs> oh, don't. Start as you mean to go on. Tom King's in the house. Hello, Tom. Best hour of the day. Looking forward to story time. Hope the forge is lit and that the smith is in fine fettle and good form. Adina Sparks is speaking of the forge being lit, sparks flying everywhere, and uh, hopefully some nice item of jewellery burning in the embers. Hello, Adina, and welcome to the live stream. Macman is in MN in the USA. Is that Montana? Or it's not Maine. Maine is ME, isn't it? Mm, forgive me for not knowing all of my state abbreviations. Um, uh, Macman. Montana, where else could it be? It's not Missouri. Yeah, I think it's Montana. If I'm wrong, please, please correct me, but you're very welcome. Marie Landon is in the house saying hello to everybody. Slonja, Marie, hope you are in great form. Good to have you along. Barbara Barney says hello, everyone. Hello, Barbara. Welcome to the library. And Scott Doherty says, oh boy, it's Monday. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Yes, indeed. I hope that's a, a, a reason to celebrate, to be in good form. Deborah Williams hopes that everyone is doing well. Well, I can't speak for everyone else, but I can certainly say for myself that yes, indeed, all good here in good form. Uh, Bernie Courtney says, good evening from a misty castle bar. Sounds very otherworldly, ethereal. Hope it's At least I hope it's mild, Bernie. Uh, Katie McMahon is waving from Michigan. Hello, Katie. Welcome along. Karen Fay O'Loughlin says it's sunny in Boulder. Brilliant stuff. And we always welcome our friends from Colorado to the live stream. Daisy Peters is in the house. Great start to the week, Anthony and my dearest Tua. And let's go for another fascinating episode. Yes, indeed. Um, I hope you do find it fascinating. Olwen Roy Badziak is in the house where it's nice and warm in Berkshire. Brilliant. The sun well, the sun's gone down here, so it's gone get down there, but the sun has been shining for you today, I hope. A few laughing faces for the joke. Thank you. Uh, I hope they're not sympathy laughs. Uh, uh, Diana is in North Berwick in Maine, in the USA, where it's about 80 Fahrenheit with a slight breeze. Well, that will keep you cool, hopefully. Um, <laughs> uh, Desiree says, that was great. I presume that was the uh, joke. Yes, indeed. Pinot more. Elaine, <laughs> a sister grape of the Pinot Grigio. Pinot more. Uh, Elaine Dent, Lingenfelter, Minnesota. I was wrong. Oh, oh, oh. Apologies. There you go. Karen Fay O'Loughlin also reminded me of uh, my, my need to memorize the, uh, the abbreviations for the states. Claire Quinn is looking forward to this. Well, I hope we uh, live up to your expectations. Uh, Claire, um, good afternoon to all. Who's that? That's Erica Bow. Hello, Erica. Very good to see you watching on the Mythical Ireland community. Brendan Byrne is saying good evening from Glendalough. Even with the beautiful day we had today, there's a touch of autumn in the night air. Yes, indeed. Hang on a second till I show Brendan's comment on the screen. Yes, indeed. And I mean, the sun has gone down. It's only 10 past eight here. I mean, you know, a couple of months ago, the sun was beating in the windows here and we had to keep the blinds down during the live streams. But anyway, such is the way the year works. And we are rapidly progressing towards the next great festival in the uh, eight uh, festival year of the Celtic calendar, which is uh, Autumn Equinox. Nula Doyle says hello to everyone. Hi, Nula. Welcome to the live stream. Gary Kyo is uh, saying Gia Gritch and good, uh, great and good to another fine day on the sod from Tala in South Dublin. Yes, indeed. I hope you had as much sunshine as we did. It really broke up the cloud this morning and uh, allowed us a very nice day. It's to be cloudy for most of the week, though. I hate to break that to you. Paul Campbell 
is in Galway on the West Coast. Hello, Paul. Good evening. Hope you are suitably ensconced. Donna Ferrer is in the house. Hi, everyone. It's a beautiful day in Tacoma Park in Maryland. Glad to hear it. So let's spread a bit of sunshine around the place. Susan Murphy is uh, giving us an inky hello from Bar Harbor. Why is it inky? Are you writing or drawing or creating art? That sounds interesting. And another reminder that MN is Minnesota. Must try and remember that. Hello, hello. That's Karen Gogus, our very good friend and 3D artist. The one who brings ancient monuments that have disappeared back to life through 3D modeling. What a superb artist he is, too. Uh, George, George, Geographica Sacra is in Italy. Happy for second round. Well, I hope you enjoy the second round. And if the first round must have been good enough with the odd joke interspersed to help you to come back again. Uh, Patrick Murray is in Ashbourne, which is Kilieglon in Gundinami, only just a few miles down the road from us here. Yes, indeed. And I have a son who works in Tato Park up in Kilbrew. Not far away from you there, Patrick. Carol Barrett says, hi, everyone. It's been a while since I've been on a live, but following all your brilliant videos, all the same. Autumn blessings to you all. Thank you, Carol. Uh, we missed you, and it's great to have you back. And yes, indeed, greetings and autumn blessings to you as well. The wheel turns, says Archaeostronomy Database. Yes, indeed. Katrina Valenzuela is in Cape Cod. Hello, Katrina. How are you keeping? Long time no see. One of the few, there's probably only a handful of the uh, Mythflix viewers who I've actually met in person. So there you go. Um, Karen Faye O'Loughlin says, I wouldn't presume to ask you to memorize US state codes. Well, here's a sort of a nerdy piece of information for you. I'm a licensed radio amateur. I think I've told you that before. My call sign is Echo India 2 Kilo Charlie. And uh, during contacts with operators or radio amateurs in the United States, especially in uh, radio contesting, sometimes they have to give their state and they give it in abbreviated form. So I actually should know them. I, it's not that I need to know them to have my license, but it's very handy to know them. So when somebody says 599 PA, that's 599 signal strength and i'm calling you from pennsylvania or ca for california or co for colorado but there's a few of them that i'm just not sure of so uh, i i must i must do better uh e humberducey says evening everyone from erica in ipswich in suffolk hello erica you're very very welcome i hope the weather has been fine in suffolk and that life is treating you well uh oh now things are moving on very quickly. Kevin Riley, evening folks. Faye Aberdeen. Hi, Kevin. Nice to see you. Uh, Barbara says that most Americans couldn't name a single county in Ireland. I think we are amazed at how well you know our part of the world. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the I think I think most Americans would know, for instance, Cork, Tipperary, Clare, and Dublin. Yeah, I'd say they'd know that much. Maybe even Sligo. And the one that's, uh, if you don't mind me uh, taking the mic for a moment, a lot of Americans pronounce Donegal as Donegal or Donegal, you know? Uh, Do Donegal. A lot of Americans know Donegal. They just can't say it properly. But that's okay. That's perfectly okay. Wait till you hear my, the way I butchered the pronunciation of some uh, Welsh place names and French words and all that kind of stuff, and then you'll know. Uh, the full Irish GK says, Gia Glitch all. August Tussafane, welcome along. Amanda says, good evening, 10 p.m. here in Helsinki. Chilly and dark. Dark have been my dreams of late. You're very welcome. And I hope it's not too dark and too cold in Helsinki and that we can warm you up with a little bit of reading. Ah, there's the Rebel County now represented. Michael Foley is in County Cork with the big thumbs up. And hello to you. Oh, Vicky Kelly is in Tasmania. Wow, brilliant stuff. A very good morning to you, Vicky. Thank you for getting out of bed at an ungodly hour to join us on the live stream. Always, always a pleasure to see people from the other side of the world joining us. I think it's a Tuesday morning where you are. It's still Monday evening here, but a very good morning to you, and I hope you have a great day. 
Yes, Mavanway says we'll have to increase the numbers and all come over to Ireland for that get together. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. I think that could let's try and maybe make that happen, you know, next year, maybe. Yeah. 2022. Finglas, who's in Finglas? Facebook user. That would be oh, I, I can't see who that is now because that's disappeared off my uh, damn. I apologize to whoever's in Finglas. But uh, glad to hear you're having a good evening. And apologies that I can't see your name. M.E. is Maine. Yes, indeed. Nancy Connolly uh, in New York. Grandma from Mayo. Grandpa from Galway. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Nancy, great to see you on the live stream. You're welcome. Katie McMahon says Mayo. There you go. You see, Mayo. Can't leave Mayo out either. Christopher Carroll says New Boyo. On here, Anthony, looking forward to hearing your take on the subject. I've been reading Young a lot over the last year, and it's such a cool talk for you to do, considering your own knowledge of Irish myth and Young's take on the importance of myth. Well, I happen to be a big fan, um, notwithstanding the things we spoke about last week. Uh, he's human, like everyone else, and had his flaws, one of them being that he was quite a philanderer in his day. Uh, Slow Owls is in Humboldt County in California. Very good evening to you, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Kevin, I, I still can't pronounce that word. Is it antipodes or is it antipodes? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Hang on a second. Something a little Google won't help us with. Antipodes. 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 So you would be um, an, antipodean. Is that right? Antipodes. Yes. Not antipodes. Antipodean. Okay, we'll try and remember that. Where are we? Genie Mackers. I'm sorry, but this is hard to keep up with. Vermont. Barbara Kling is in Vermont. Hello, Barbara. Welcome along to the live stream. Great to see you. Patrick Connellan is in Halifax in Nova Scotia. Very good afternoon to all our Nova Scotian friends, all our new Scottish friends. And as we know from previous live streams, Scotland is really named after Ireland. So Nova Scotia is really New Ireland. Sorry, Scottish viewers, Mandy McCurl and all that. I'm claiming that one. Um, Diana is naming Waterford. You see, there you go. But who knows? Who knows what the smallest county in Ireland is? And who knows how many people know that Rhode Island is the smallest state? I know that much. Antipodeans. Yep. If only we could do that with the Welsh words, says Mavanwy. Yeah, I've been in that situation. I would love a website where you could just type in the place name or the character name that you're looking to pronounce and get it properly, you know. Oh, Karen's giving us a lesson here now. Let's, let's, let's. Montana is MT, right? Missouri is MO. Maine is ME. Mississippi is MS. Maryland is MD. Massachusetts is MA. Michigan, MI. It's a little hard with so many M's. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Uh, Karen, uh, that's exactly my excuse. Mandy says, hey, we're all Irish on here. I like it. I like it. Yes, indeed. Uh, Beth Kelly is in Oklahoma, and you're very welcome to this evening's live stream. Just to remind you, as usual, if you want to support the work of Mythical Ireland, please, please consider becoming a patron. That's the address there at the bottom of the screen. Patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland, where you get rewards. The newest reward added in the past few months is a monthly video update from behind the scenes uh, informing you as to what's going on. And you get early access to photographs and blog posts and articles and uh, podcasts and videos and some exclusive stuff that nobody ever, nobody else ever gets to see. So please do consider becoming a patron. Uh, don't forget also that you can purchase all of the Mythical Ireland uh, publications, including the three from this year on the Mythical Ireland website at mythicalireland.com. And I post worldwide and I will sign all copies of the books that leave here to go to you. Return to Segish and the two monographs, Finn and the Salmon of Knowledge, which is monograph number one, and Bowen, the goddess of the River Boyne and the Milky Way, the second in the series. The third one yet to be decided, but I'm busy preparing the material for the revised and expanded version of Mythical Ireland, which is due out in November. I'm very busy with that right now. Hey, Elaine says, I think I know. Loud. Yes, indeed. And I wonder where you might have heard that. Um, 
Ms. Marion is in the house. Oh, brilliant. From Alameda in California. A very good evening to you, Ms. Marion. We haven't seen you in a while. I hope you are keeping safe and well. Always a great pleasure to have you along for the live streams. And at uh, 21 minutes past the hour, Marianne Kindia is also in the house in Connecticut, where it's a beautiful day. Glad to hear it. Patricia, Patsy O'Malley, what did I miss? Well, where do we start? But nothing that you can't watch back on both the Facebook page and on YouTube, because all of these live streams are saved as videos that you can watch later. Last week, we were speaking about the late, great C.G. Jung, Carl Gustav Jung, the Swiss psychoanalyst, the father of this, the, 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 the so-called father of analytical science. Or, along with Freud, he's very well known. Um, we spoke about his um, interest in mythology. We spoke about his um, his interest in, in religion and I might fix my glasses and the spiritual experience and how that um, has been an important mainstay of human life and bringing meaning to life for people for not just generations and centuries, but in fact, for millennia, for as long as we've been speaking and writing and telling telling each other stories. Um, Patrick Connellan, send me an email about that, please. And uh, I'll see if I can help you. If I can, I will. If I can't, I'll just tell you so. But no problem. Hello, everyone from the Yarra Ranges in Victoria, Australia. Hello, uh, M MCB. Is it MCB? Uh, very good morning to you. And we also have someone watching from Tasmania. So brilliant. James Walsh is looking forward to Mr. C.G. Young and his answer to Job. I, perhaps through the meditation on Irish mythology, as his studies were in many directions. Yes, indeed. Will do. Thank you. Okay, Patrick, that's great. Uh, so I'll just read. Uh, I actually don't know the significance of the cheese grater. And if somebody does, please post it into a comment. I meant to say that before. I have no idea why there's a cheese grater on the cover of this book. I never made the connection. Anyway, it's probably something really stupid, really, really easy. And I'm going to feel stupid when it's pointed out to me. But uh, please forgive me for my lack of knowledge. If there's something really obvious. Oh, dear. A uh, little bit of a, a studio lighting technical issue here <sighs> that's what happens when you don't have any staff as i read this is from don cupit c-u-p-i-t-t as i read this short book again after a 20-year gap i am again provoked beguiled and dazzled by its frequent flashes of brilliance of all the books of the bible few have had more resonance for modern readers than the book the book of job I pronounce that Job. Some people pr pronounce it Job. For a world that over the past century has witnessed horrors the like of which could not have been imagined by earlier generations, Job's cries of despair and incomprehension are all too recognisable. The visionary psychotherapist Carl Gustav Jung understood this and responded with this remarkable book in which he set himself face to face with, quote, the unvarnished spectacle of divine savagery and ruthful ruthlessness Jung perceived in the hidden recesses of the human psyche the cause of a crisis that plagues modern humanity and leaves the individual like job isolated and bewildered in the face of impenetrable fortune by correlating the transcendental with the unconscious Jung, writing not as a biblical scholar but quote as a layman and physician who has been privileged to see deeply into the psychic life of many people unquote offers a way for every reader to come to terms with the divine darkness which confronts each individual. Carl Gustav Jung was born in 1875 and passed away in 1961. He founded the Analytical School of Psychology and developed a radical new theory of the unconscious. And as we were saying last week, apart from the frequent mentions of his uh, uh, flirtatious and wayward behaviour with the women, uh, he, he, his work seems to engender reactions that that uh, that range from utter disdain to neutrality uh, to uh, a complete uh, and encompassing love there are so many people excuse me who are fans of Jung 
fans of his work. There are so many Jungian schools and uh, Jungian uh, um, practitioners of psychology in the modern world, you know. Okay, and we have a comment from Movanway who has done a bit of Googling. Yes, let's have a look at this. What the hell is going on with the book cover? A cheese grater. Have I slipped into psychosis, a world where kitchen equipment is the highest form of symbolism? Jung grapples with the answer to Job, and the publishers think the question is cheddar or Wensleydale, which is best <laughs> for me. That doesn't answer the question at all. <laughs> but in fairness, Jung often did say, didn't he, that the symbols uh, uh, and the characters and the metaphors that emerge in, especially in, in the dream state uh, that emerge from the unconscious uh, are objective to the point of sometimes seeming ridiculous and absurd and incongruous and uh, incomprehensible, uh, ineffable in some cases. But they have a perfect, perfect, perfect meaning for the dreamer. It's that the dreamer does not possess, uh, not necessarily the intellect, this isn't about intellect, doesn't possess the intuition or the, the the knowledge of symbolism or you know uh, the life experience to uh, interpret those you know Robin Edgar's in the house and he's still talking about solar eclipses in the Boyne Valley in the fourth millennium uh, BC I mean, eight cans in the last week I'm having a cup out with some high quality Scottish shortbread biscuits well great but you know that you can add a little bit of just between you and me, like, I hope there's no one listening, but you know you can add a drop of the crater to a cup of tea. Just saying that. Tom says he finds it very cheesy. <laughs> Nick Eska Casterton is in the house. Hello, Nick. You're very welcome along. Yes, Sean McKenna says it must be because Jung is uh, contemplating on uh, things that are greater and greater. Your joke jokes are nearly as bad as mine, all you people. Uh, young and mythology, yes, indeed. It, perhaps it contains cheesy subjects, says Karen Gogus. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Swiss cheese. Oh, Swiss cheese, yes. Ah, there you go. Uh, anyway, we will press on. And uh, here are a few uh, quotes about uh, Answer to Job. The first one is from uh, uh, Lawrence van der Post, who we spoke about last week, one of Jung's biographers uh, and a friend of his in late in Jung's life who was a, a bit of a mystic himself, but a really, really fabulously wonderful writer, one of the best that I've ever re re read, but who also had a flawed personality. He was more than a psychological or scientific phenomenon. He was, to my mind, one of the greatest religious phenomena the world has ever experienced. And I suppose if you if you wanted to, if, if you thought maybe that was maybe overrating him slightly, I suppose all you could do is is look at the influence that he has had, how many uh, scholars, scientists, um, and religious figureheads have had um, such such a vast following so long after he's passed away. I mean, he's 60, 50, 60 years gone now, isn't it? 60 years. This is from the Times Literary Supplement. Nowhere is Jung himself so moved and personally involved as when he deals with the relationship between man and God. For in his view, this is the centre around which the life of the psyche revolves with all its potentialities for salvation or spiritual disaster. He seems, as it were, predestined to break down frontiers between religion and psychology. And indeed, it was often said that Jung wanted to frame uh, a lot of psychological problems, uh, neuroses, uh, neuroses and psychoses, uh, in religious terms, and believed that a person had, had a better opportunity uh, to come back from, especially from the brink of psychosis or schizophrenia, uh, by looking deep into that dark psyche of themselves, uh, and especially those images that emerged and uh, that apparently didn't make any sense. Somebody else is saying something about the cheese grater that I should read. <laughs> uh, Kevin Riley, that's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love cream in my coffee, but not tea, says Donna Jean Porter. So just just, just in case you didn't get the reference, in Ireland, crather is another way of saying whiskey. 
The, gr the cheese grater is the lived life, shredding the ideals of an innocent soul. Buddha's unavoidable suffering. There you go. Thank you, Astro Gypsy, for that very thoughtful comment. But uh, if you want cream in your tea or your coffee, by all means. But uh, as I say, crater, you know. Um, <laughs> this is from A.M. Silver from the British Journal of Psychology. Jung points out that the psychology of religion has two aspects. The psychology of religious persons and the psychology of religious contents. He has himself in this book made a rare and original contribution to the latter. And from Kathleen Rain, or A I N E. Dr. Jung speaks with the authority and conviction of his professional insight into the mind of an age whose great longing is for some new heavenly marriage that shall produce a new divine child to save us from impending apocalypse. And indeed, I should say that on that note, the book is not all about. The book of Job. Uh, he also, Jung, in the book, writes quite a lot about Revelation. He does a little bit of psychological examination of St. John the Divine, the author of Revelation, assumes him to be the same John uh, as in um, the, the, the uh, compiler of um, the Gospel, um, and says that he didn't see enough evidence to suggest that he was experiencing psychosis, but suggested instead that John, being a very devout and holy man, had been so leaning towards that all the time and making so much effort to be a good Christian that the unconscious had, um, what's the word, compensated for all of that with these very dark visions. However, Jung has some uh, uh, opinions about the visionary aspect of uh, revelation that I think are worth listening to and I certainly will be talking about them um, now introduction um, I, I'm not sure where I read it and forgive me if I'm not entirely accurate but I understand that Jung wrote answer to Job in a very short period of time uh, it had it was something that had been brewing up inside him for years and uh, he just sat down one day and cleared the desk and started writing it and after a period of a few days, he had it completely written. And then he felt, I think, I understand that he felt quite unwell for a few days afterwards. Uh, undoubtedly due to some process of abreaction or, or um, catharsis. That he had sort of gotten all this stuff, uh, quote unquote, off his chest, so to speak. And this is a note on the text. Like Freud, Jung drew on, the, on his classical education when inventing his own technical terms. Oh yeah, this is good because... Uh, Young, when you read Young's work, you 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 have to you have to refer to to all sorts of dictionaries and 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 uh, uh, glossaries uh, uh, to help you with some of the terminology. Some of the ones used in answer to Job may be unfamiliar to modern re readers. Briefly, then, in antiodromia is a running back and forth between opposite poles of feeling, the sort of thing that in affairs of the heart is apt to be called the rebound. Like Freud, Jung sees our passions and drives as coming in paired opposites, such as tenderness and violence, that tend to spill over into each other. Pleroma, P-L-E-R-O-M-A, is a gnostic term meaning fullness, often used of a complete pantheon, the full set of spirit beings that populates a particular version of heaven. Moira, M-O-I-R-A, is fate, Pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, is spirit. Anumen, A-N-U-M-E-N, is any spirit or presence that attracts religious awe. The hieros gamos is a sacred marriage of spirit beings, which may be enacted by humans in the temple. And we see that in the Banashri from Irish tradition, where the king ritually marries the landscape. And the landscape, of course, is the in the form of the goddess of sovereignty, sometimes represented by a white mare. Um, which may be enacted by humans in the temple and is a notable theme in Bronze Age religion. The conjun conjun conjunctio opisotorum is what in colloquial English is signified by the phrase extremes meet. And the quinta essentia or quintessence is a fifth heavenly element in addition to the four earthly elements of earth, water, air and fire. Yes, uh, uh, Patrick, uh, 
I would be inclined to agree with you that Job is a horrible book. I never understood how it could be seen either as inspirational or comforting. God himself comes across morally questionable, possibly worse than the devil. Yeah, and I think what Jung did with answer, answer to Job was to finally give us an explanation for why the hell it seemed uh, that this, uh, uh, this great uh, uh, deity, pardon me, was so capricious that he could sway between tender love uh, and abject cruelty, uh, you know? And I remember uh, once being at mass, <laughs> <laughs> from time to time very on a very rare occasion these days i go to mass for you know i'm not a practicing uh, catholic anymore but sometimes i find myself in church uh, at maybe a memorial for a family member or something that you know it's important to just be there and commemorate and i heard one day a priest saying you know int introducing um he was introducing a prayer by saying, you know, God, trusting that you love us and you care for us and that you are, a, you know, a compassionate being and all this, that and the other. And I nearly under my breath, I nearly muttered, you haven't read the book of Job yet, you know, um, because uh, I think I think in some way that perhaps the modern church likes to focus a little bit more on the New Testament rather than the old testament because the god of the old testament was an angry dude you know very jealous prone to anger easy to provoke kind of person uh, kind of deity you know the book book i keep saying book the book of job is a landmark in the long historical development of the divine drama at the time the book was written there were already many testimonies which had given a contradictory picture of yahweh the picture of a god who knew no moderation in his emotions and suffered precisely from this lack of moderation. He himself admitted that he was eaten up with rage and jealousy and that this knowledge was painful to him. And it's a funny thing that sort of non-practicing Christians or perhaps, you know, um, lapsed Christians and Catholics Sometimes when you say to somebody, I think I've said this before, you know, what's the first commandment? People, some, sometimes people say the first commandment is thou shalt not kill, which it should be really, shouldn't it? I mean, that should be the ultimate sin to kill somebody else, to take somebody else's life. But in fact, no, the first commandment is that thou shalt not have any other gods before me, uh, indicating the uh, extreme jealousy of this, uh, this dude who doesn't like to have any other uh, gods worshipped in his place. How the people of the Old Testament felt about their God, we know from the testimony of the Bible. That is not what I am concerned with here, but rather with the way in which a modern man with a Christian education and background comes to terms with the divine darkness which is unveiled in the book of Job and what effect it has on him. I shall not give a cool and carefully considered exegesis that tries to be fair to every detail, but a purely subjective reaction. So right at the introduction, Jung is laying out his cards. He's saying, look, this is not going to be what you think or what you may want. Uh, you know, um, this is very involved from his point of view. You know, this is in, an impassioned piece of writing, uh, not a dispassionate work. In this way, I hope to act as a voice for many who feel the same way as I do and to give expression to the shattering emotion that the unvarnished spectacle of divine savagery and ruthlessness produces in us. Even if we know by hearsay about the suffering and discord in the deity, they are so lacking in reflection and so morally ineffectual that they arouse no human sympathy or understanding. Indeed, they give rise to an equally ill-considered outburst of affect and a smouldering resentment that may be compared to a slowly healing wound. And just as there is a secret tie between the wound and the weapon, so the affect corresponds to the violence of the deed that caused it. The book, the book, <laughs> stop that, Anthony. The book of Job serves as a paradigm for a certain experience of God, which has a special significance for us today. And I think this is the major significance of answer to Job. It is not just an examination of the God of the Old Testament uh, and his antinomy and his dichotomy uh, and his swaying from goodness to badness and, and from, for, for, from a pleasant disposition to outright anger. It is also, crucially, 
how that is merely a reflection of the condition of the human psyche. That either, well, this is my, 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 my interpretation, not, not Jung's, either we have um, projected or reflected that aspect, that antinomy within us, uh, that enantiodromia, that uh, conflict, onto him when we wrote about him, or he has projected it onto us, uh, us, we being made in his image. These experiences come upon man from inside as well as from outside, and it is useless to interpret them rationalistically and thus weaken them by apotropaic means. It is far better to admit the effect and submit to its violence than try to escape it by all sorts of intellectual tricks and emotional value judgments. Although by giving away to the affect one imitates all the bad qualities of the outrageous act that provoked it and thus makes oneself guilty of the same fault. That is pre precisely the point of the whole proceeding. The violence is meant to penetrate man's vitals and he to succumb to its action. He must be affected by it, otherwise its full effect will not reach him. But he should know or learn to know what has affected him, because in this way, he transforms the blindness of the violence on one hand and of the affect on the other into knowledge. For this reason, I shall express my affect fearlessly and ruthlessly in what follows, and I shall answer injustice with injustice, that I may learn to know why and to what purpose Job was wounded and what consequences have grown out of this for Yahweh as well as for man. I don't think we need to read the book of Job because that would take several episodes. Uh, but in summary, Job was a very uh, devout uh, believer in, in God. Uh, and, um, you know, he, 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 he was exemplary, actually. Um, and uh, Satan basically uh, goaded Yahweh and taunted him. And, uh, you know, uh, wanted him to inflict suffering upon uh, Job to see if Job would Job would react and disown him. And somehow, rather than telling Satan to feck off, you know, go away and leave me alone, you scurrilous pest, he goes along with it. Uh, he causes uh, um, Job's family to be slaughtered and his servants to be killed his livestock to be destroyed and his crops and uh, even at that uh, uh, job refuses uh, to give in uh, in terms of his his faith and his his belief etc etc i'm going to read what i propose to do is i'm going to read various highlighted sections to give an idea uh, just to give you a taste of it highly recommend of course that you go um and and and, and obtain a copy yourself it's a short book and it shouldn't be expensive to purchase. It runs to uh, 142 pages. And I read it in a day and was deeply fascinated by it, deeply moved by it. Um, so these dark deeds follow each other in rapid succession. You know, it's that uh, Job is punished not just once, but several times over. One must bear in mind here the dark deeds that follow one after another in quick succession. Robbery, murder, bodily injury with premeditation and denial of fair trial. This is further exacerbated by the fact that Yahweh displays no compunction, remorse or compassion, but only ruthlessness and brutality. The plea of unconsciousness is invalid, seeing that he flagrantly violates at least three of the commandments he himself gave out on Mount Sinai. One of the things that, you know, um, that, that really obviously wasn't being addressed, you know, by the, by the church in the 20th century, perhaps for centuries beforehand, was this uh, tendency to ruthlessness and brutality and how it was that Yahweh was able to, uh, to violate uh, his own commandments. Job's friends do everything in their power to contribute to his moral torments. And instead of giving him whom God has uh, perfidiously abandoned their warm hearted support, they moralize in an all too human manner, that is, in the stupidest fashion imaginable, and fill him 
with wrinkles. They thus deny him even the last comfort of sympathetic participation and human understanding, so that one cannot altogether suppress the suspicion of connivance in high places. Why Job's torments and the divine bet should suddenly come to an end is not quite clear. So long as Job does not actually die, the pointless suffering could be continued indefinitely. We must, however, keep an eye on the background of all these events. It is just possible that something in this background will gradually begin to take shape as a compensation for Job's undeserved suffering. Something to which Yahweh, even if he had only a faint inkling of it, could hardly remain indifferent. Without Yahweh's knowledge and contrary to his intentions, the tormented, though guiltless Job had secretly been lifted up to a superior knowledge of God, which God himself did not possess. Had Yahweh consulted his omnis om omniscience, Job would not have had the advantage of him, but then so many other things could not have happened either. Job realizes God's inner antinomy, that's this conflict or paradox. And in the light of this realization, his knowledge attains a divine numinosity. The possibility of this development lies, one must suppose, in man's godlikeness, which one should certainly not look for in human morphology. Yahweh himself had guarded against this error by forbidding the making of images. Job, by his insistence on bringing his case before God, even without hope of a hearing, had stood his ground and thus created the very obstacle, pardon me, that forced God to reveal his true nature. With this dramatic climax, Yahweh abruptly breaks off his cruel game of cat and mouse. But if anyone should expect that his wrath will now be turned against the slanderer, he will be severely disappointed. Yahweh does not think of bringing this mischief-making son of his to account, nor does it ever occur to him to give Job at least the moral satisfaction of explaining his behaviour. Instead, he comes riding along on the tempest of his almightiness and thunders reproaches at the half-crushed human worm. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without insight? And that's Job 38, verse 2. In view of the subsequent words of Yahweh, one must really ask oneself, who is darkening what counsel? The only dark thing here is how Yahweh ever came to make a bet with Satan. It is certainly not Job who has darkened anything, and least of all, a council, for there was never any talk of that, nor will there be in what follows. The bet does not contain any council, so far as one can see, unless, of course, it was Yahweh himself who egged Satan on for the purpose, for the ultimate purpose of exalting Job. Naturally, this development was, was foreseen in omniscience, and it may be that the word council refers to this eternal and absolute knowledge. If so, Yahweh's attitude seems more illogical and incomprehensible, as he could then have enlightened Job on this point, which, in view of the wrong done to him, would have been only fair and equitable. I must therefore regard this possibility as improbable. Whose words are without insight? Presumably Yahweh is not referring to the words of Job's friends, but is rebuking Job. But what is Job's guilt? The only thing he can be blamed for is this incurable optimism in believing that he can appeal to divine justice. In this he is mistaken, as Yahweh's subsequent words prove, God does not want to be just. He merely flaunts might over right. Job could not get that into his head because he looked upon God as a moral being. He had never doubted God's might, but had hoped for right as well. He had, however, already taken back this error when he recognised God's contradictory nature, and by doing so, he assigned a place to God's justice and goodness, so one can hardly speak of a lack of insight. <clears throat> one could have to choose positively grotesque examples to illustrate the disproportion between the two antagonists. Yahweh sees something in Job which he would not ascribe to him but to God. That is, an equal power which causes him to bring out his whole power machine and parade it before his opponent. Yahweh projects onto Job a skeptic's face, which is, which is hateful to him because it is his, his own, and which gazes at him with an uncanny and critical eye. He is afraid of it, for only in the face of something frightening does one let off a cannonade of references to one's power, 
cleverness, courage, invincibility, etc. Just check in the comments to see if I'm missing anything. Well, yes, Lara Herbert, Job comes across as a stubborn whore, but uh, he, he, uh, he has to be, doesn't he? Doesn't he? I mean, that's the point, isn't it? Uh, Sean McKenna wants to know what's my favorite book of writings of young. Well, I'm reading from it. That's uh, that is my favorite so far of the ones that I've read. Yeah, absolutely. Well, monotheism. Well, another point here, of course, is that uh, pantheism uh, sort of I think accounted for you know these conditions of the psyche that are difficult to represent in one apparently all-knowing all, all good deity you know i mean in celtic mythology you have characters who are tricksters and you have characters who are sort of you know it's a bit like the uh it's a bit like the olympians and the you know and their enemies the the, the, the tuadadanum and the fomorians it's like in the older mythologies, it would have seemed to me that uh, there's a place given for that. There's a place for understanding that, you know, um, humans are given over to conflicting behavior, uh, saying conflicting things, behaving in, 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 a, in a manner that, you know, is not uh, beholden to one's community. Uh, and just to reinforce the previous point, he reacts, this is Yahweh, irritably to every word that has the faintest suggestion of criticism. In other words, he seems to be excessively narcissistic. While he himself does not care a straw for his own moral code if his actions happen to run counter to its statutes. And I'm going to move on. I'm going to read out some other... Um, uh passages that are uh, especially later in the book as the book gets on actually it gets more interesting in my opinion you know uh job is also about how the image of the divine has changed over time uh yes perhaps uh, mandy <clears throat> um but i do think and i'm uh, i'm trying to agree with with campbell and campbell in talking about the uh the functions of mythology you know, that there's this pedagogical function, this sort of life teaching, life affirming function that you basically encounter the darkness in the stories as a as a means of 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 the realization that that lies within you. And the hero uh, quest, um, the hero's journey of, of Campbell, which is derived in part, at least from the work of Jung, suggesting that, you know, all of these uh, uh, obstacles uh, in the form of monsters and dark caves, etc., actually need to be entered in order to kind of progress. Uh, whereas it seems that, and especially when we get to talk about St. John the Divine, is that, you know, it seems that, you know, that devoutly, uh, de devout believers um, project an image, uh, a persona of, of, of goodness and devotion and faith and all the rest love thy neighbor as thyself love thy love thine enemy and all that stuff um turn the other cheek and all that stuff um but the difficulty for that is all the time jung says down in the unconscious there is something that wants to compensate for that um and, and we'll get to that because it, it is interesting um yeah, what would uh, Jung have said to Job if he was his patient? It's not your unconscious, it's God. Yes, indeed. Um, and that's from Dolmach. Um, he talks too about, you know, the symbolism of the 
the Old Testament's Sophia or the the divine personification of um, that sort of feminine wisdom figure um, and how, you know, um, it was never able to, that feminine principle was never able to prevail over the uh, the patriarchal supremacy, uh, which is part of the problem, um, uh, according to Jung. In relation to, uh, I know, I'm, I'm slightly disjointed now. Uh, I will find my rhythm again momentarily in relation to the New Testament and, um, you know, uh, Christ. The new son shall, on the one hand, be a Catholic man like Adam, mortal and capable of suffering. But on the other hand, he shall not be like Adam, a mere copy, but God himself begotten by himself as the father and rejuvenating the father as the son. As God, he has always been God. And as the son of Mary, who is plainly a copy of Sophia, he is the Logos, synonymous with Nuos, who, like Sophia, is a master craftsman, as stated by the Gospel according to St. John. This identity of mother and son is borne out over and over again in the myths. Okay, let's move. Let's move, because there's lots of stuff that I need to get through. I'm just going to read, as I say, passages that I highlighted for various reasons. But in omniscience, there had existed from all eternity a knowledge of the human nature of God or the divine nature of man. And that harps back to something I was speaking about earlier on, which is that when you when when you read Answer to Job, you, you, you must leave some room for coming to terms with the notion that either, as I said, we have projected our uh, human flaws onto the deity or the deity as because he created us in his image uh, he has projected those onto us uh, or vice versa or both at the same time michael pike has jo joined us hello michael excuse me you're very welcome it was only very lately that we realized or rather are beginning to realize that god is reality itself and therefore last but not least man this realization is a millennial process. If we consider Yahweh's behavior up to the reappearance of Sophia as a whole, one indubitable fact strikes us, the fact that his actions are accompanied by an inferior consciousness. Time and again, we miss reflection and regard for absolute knowledge. His consciousness seems to be not much more than a primitive awareness which knows no reflection and no morality. One merely perceives and acts blindly without conscious inclusion of the subject whose individual existence raises no problems. Today, we would call such a state psychologically unconscious and uh, juristically, it would be descri described as non compos mentis. The fact that consciousness does not perform acts of thinking does not, however, prove that they do not exist. They merely occur unconsciously and make themselves felt indirectly in dreams, visions, revelations, and instinctive changes of consciousness, whose very nature tells us that they derive from an unconscious knowledge and are the result of unconscious acts of judgment or unconscious conclusions. Some such process can be observed in the curious change which comes over Yahweh's behavior after the Job episode. There can be no doubt that he did not immediately become conscious of the moral defeat he had suffered at Job's hands. In his omniscience, of course, this fact had been known from all eternity, and it is not unthinkable that the knowledge of it unconsciously brought him into the position of dealing so harshly with Job in order that he himself should become conscious of something through this conflict and thus gain new insight. Satan, who with good reason later on received the name of Lucifer, knew how to make more frequent and better use of omniscience than did his father. It seems he was the only one among the sons of God who developed that much initiative. At all events, it was he who placed those unforeseen incidents in Yahweh's way, which omniscience knew to be necessary and indeed indispensable for the unfolding and completion of the divine drama. Among these is the case of Job. Among these, the case of Job was decisive and it could only have happened thanks to Satan's initiative. 
Further on, he says uh, that Sophia steps in and she reinforces the much needed self reflection and thus makes possible Yahweh's decision to become man. It is a decision fraught with consequences. He raises himself above his earlier primitive level of consciousness by indirectly acknowledging that, ma that, that the man Job is morally superior to him and that therefore he has to catch up and become human himself. In other words, what Jung is suggesting uh, that one of the responses uh, of Yahweh uh, to the episode involving Job was to decide that he was going to come to earth in human form, uh, knowing that in doing so, that he would suffer greatly uh, and that uh, that would compensate, make up for uh, in some way, um, you know, the the uh, the t terrible suffering he had inflicted on Job. It goes, I, and, I, and I am skipping here, so forgive me, I'd love to read the whole thing and I know that you'd probably all uh, be fascinated by it and say you need to get your own copy and read it because it's fascinating it goes without saying that a quite special interest attaches to the character of the fate of the incarnate son of god seen from a distance of nearly two thousand years it is uncommonly difficult to reconstruct a biographical picture of christ from the traditions that have been preserved not a single text is extant which would fulfill even the minimum modern requirements for writing a history the historically ver verifiable facts are extremely scanty and the little bi biographically valid material that exists is not sufficient for us to create out of it a constant career or an even remotely probable character. We have the same thing here in Ireland. I've said this on previous live streams in relation to our saints. It has been said time and again that the known facts of the lives of St. Patrick and St. Bridget uh, in particular could be written on the back of a postage stamp and yet the mythology about them uh, is uh, 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 abundant. Moving on. Besides his love of mankind, a certain irascibility, and that is a, you know, an easy, an ease at which, uh, easy to provoke, basically. A certain irascibility is noticeable in Christ's character, and as is often the case with people of emotional temperament, a manifest lack of self-reflection. There is no evidence that Christ ever wondered about himself or, or that he ever even confronted himself. To this rule, there is only one significant exception, the despairing cry from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here, his human nature attains divinity. At that moment, God experiences what it means to be a mortal man and, surf and drinks, wait till you hear this is brilliant, this is a brilliant quote, and drinks to the dregs what he made his faithful servant job suffer and there if in effect he's not cancelling it out as such but compensating and realizing he's on the other side of it now you know here is given the answer to job this is page 56 of the book by the way and the book runs to 143 pages we're not even halfway in and Jung effectively gives the answer to Job. Here is given the answer to Job, and clearly this supreme moment is as divine as it is human, as eschatological as it is psychological. And at this moment too, where one can feel the human being so absolutely, the divine myth is present in full force. And both mean one and the same thing. How then, how then can one possibly demythologize the figure of Christ? A rationalistic attempt of that sort would soak all the mystery out of his personality, and what remained would no longer be the birth and tragic fate of a god in time. But historically speaking, a badly authenticated religious teacher, a Jewish reformer who was Hellenistically interpreted and misunderstood, a kind of Pythagoras maybe, or if you like, a Buddha or a Mohammed, but certainly not a son of God or a God incarnate. And that's it. At that moment, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God experiences what it means to be a mortal man and drinks to the dregs what he made his faithful servant Job suffer. In view of these portentous impossibilities, it has been assumed, perhaps, as the result of growing impatience with the difficult factual material, that Christ was nothing but a myth. But this case, in this case, no more than a fiction. But myth is not fiction. 
It consists of facts that are continually repeated and can be observed over and over again. It is something that happens to man, and men have mythical fates just as much as the Greek heroes do. The fact that the life of Christ is largely myth does absolutely nothing to disprove its factual truth. Quite the contrary. I would even go so far as to say that the mythical character of a life is just what expresses its universal human validity. And, and this is what prompted uh, Campbell to say, you know, what myth do you live by? That we all live by a myth uh, derived from uh, the, the work of Jung. It is perfectly possible psychologically for the unconscious or an archetype to take complete possession of a man and to determine his fate down to the smallest detail. And so just when you think, wow, 56 pages in, we have the answer to Job. There's a lot more to come. Uh, he, he, he starts here looking at other aspects, uh, especially pertaining to the apocalypse. Uh, let me just pause for a moment to make sure everybody's okay. Yeah, Niall puts it very well. God is experiencing karma. I suppose you could put it that way, you know, that um, having unconsciously subjected uh, uh, Job to this terrible punishment, he's now on the receiving end of it, the scourging and the crucifixion. And even uh, the rebuttal by his close friends. Before the cock crows, you shall deny me three times and all that stuff, you know. Pagan Tree is in the house. Says, good evening all. You're very welcome along. Nice of you to join us. Christ's unadmitted but nonetheless evident doubt is in this respect. Uh, this is, you know, in relation to this antinomy again, you know, despite the apparently lavish generosity, uh, God had been subject to intermittent but devastating fits of rage ever since time began. And how could that suddenly become the epitome of everything that's good? Christ's unadmitted but nonetheless evident doubt in this respect is confirmed in the New Testament and particularly in the, in the Apocalypse. There, Yahweh again delivers himself up to an unheard of fury of destruction against the human race of whom a mere 144,000 specimens appear to survive. One is indeed at a loss how to bring such a reaction into line with the behaviour of a loving father, whom we would expect to glorify his creation with patience and love. As Satan was locked up for a time, then conquered and cast into a lake of fire, the destruction of the world can hardly be the work of the devil, but must be an act of God, not influenced by Satan. I, need, I intend to read uh, something I've written myself. I'm writing at the moment a book and I've written about this. I've written, there's a section about it that's about this and I intend to read that if we have time. So I'm just going to skip, 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 skip uh, and just read, highlight it again. Once more, we are appalled by the incongruous attitude of the world creator towards his creatures, who to his chagrin never behave according to his expectations. It is as if someone started a bacterial culture, which turned out to be a failure. <laughs> he might curse his look, but he would never seek the reason for the failure in the ba bachelor and wanted to punish them morally for it. Rather, he would select a more suitable culture medium. Yahweh's behavior towards his creatures contradicts all the requirements of so-called divine reason, whose possession is supposed to distinguish men from animals. Uh... No. To, to believe that God is the summum bonum, which means the highest good, is impossible for a reflecting consciousness. Such a consciousness does not feel in any way delivered from the fear of God and therefore asks itself quite rightly what Christ means to it. That indeed is the great question. Can Christ still be interpreted in our day and age or one? Or must one be satisfied with the historical interpretation? The fear of God should be considered the beginning of all wisdom. A more differentiated consciousness must sooner or later find it difficult to love as a kind father, a God whom on account of his unpredictable fits of wrath, his unreliability, injustice and cruelty, 
it has every reason to fear. The decay of the gods of antiquity has proved to our satisfaction that man does not relish any all too human inconsistencies and weaknesses in his gods. In these circumstances, the potential starts flowing from the unconscious towards consciousness, and the unconscious breaks through in the form of dreams, visions, and revelations. And I'm going to continue on. As I said, I'm going to read from something that I wrote, which is reflect reflecting on all this, and perhaps it's meaning for current times. Don't we see in the world at the moment a lot of projection uh, going on? Um, and, and a, a refusal uh, a, a refusal or an ignorance to acknowledge that uh, dichotomy, that antinomy, that light and dark that's within all of us. If ever anything had been historically prepared and sustained and supported by the existing Weltanschauung, which is the German for worldview, Christianity would be a classic example. He says here, I'm just trying to paraphrase and summarize um, that in relation to Jesus, um, you know, who is the prophet of an exclusively good God, he preserves mankind from loss of communion with God and from getting lost in mere consciousness and rationality. That would have brought something like a dissociation between consciousness and the unconscious and an unnatural and even pathological condition, a quote unquote loss of soul, which has threatened man from the beginning of time. Again and again, and in increasing measure, he gets into danger of overlooking the necessary irrationalities of the psyche and of imagining that he can control everything by will and reason alone and thus paddle his own canoe. Thank you, Coda. Yes, indeed. Okay, what's that? That's the 15 minute reminder. Okay, fair enough. They're getting tired, he says. One should keep before one's eyes the strange fact that the God of goodness is so unforgiving that he can only be appeased by a human sacrifice. This is an insufferable incongruity. And of course, this is where we're seeing Jung uh, just speaking his mind completely and utterly uh, without recourse to the sensitivities of the believers. And I apologize uh, to anybody who, who's watching this or who, who, who will watch the video afterwards who thinks this is an attack on their Christian beliefs. That's not what it is. Um, but I think Jung needed to, 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 to possess that honesty in order to tackle the subject fully. He needed to first and foremost admit his subjectivity in the matter. Uh, something else he says that, uh, uh, you know, that um, sin originally came from the heavenly court and entered into creation with the help of Satan, which enraged Yahweh to such an extent that in the end his own son had to be sacrificed in order to placate him. Strangely enough, he took no steps to remove Satan from his entourage. Uh, one of the many reasons that I found my Christian belief in which I was brought up very, very conflicting. And that will be a sort of a major a theme to the book that I'm writing at the moment, uh, which I've spoken about in more depth to the patrons, um, dealing with, you know, what is it like to be brought up as a Christian and, and then to challenge it and to challenge all this uh, contradiction uh, and to kind of step away from it and take, take a step back from it. It's wonderful from the point of view that you're able to see it with a much more independent and objective viewpoint. Um, but, you know, you, 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 you can't answer the questions. That's ultimately they're unanswerable, such as why this wearisome forbearance towards Satan? Why? Why not just get rid of him? Solve all the problems. One might also mention the strange fact that it is precisely Peter who lacks self-control and is fickle in character, whom Christ wishes to make the rock and foundation of his church. And this is where we start tying in with the author of the Apocalypse of the Revelation. One could hardly imagine a more suitable personality for the John of the Apocalypse than the author of the Epistles of John. It was he who declared that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Who said there was any darkness in God? Nevertheless, he knows that when we sin, we need an advocate with the Father, and this is Christ, 
the expiation of our sins, even though for his sake our sins are already forgiven. Why then do we need an advocate? The Father has bestowed his great love upon us, though it had to be bought at the cost of a human sacrifice. And we are the children of God. He who is begotten by God commits no sin. Who commits no sin? Is Jung's question. Nobody. There isn't a single individual in the world who can live up to the standards. John then preaches the message of love. God himself is love, perfect love, casteth, casteth out fear. But he must warn against false prophets and teachers of false doctrines. And it is he who announces the coming of the Antichrist. His conscious attitude is orthodox, but he has evil forebodings. John is a bit too sure and therefore he runs the risk of dissociation. Under these circumstances, a counterposition is bound to arise in the unconscious, which can then erupt into unconsciousness in the form of a revelation. Repent. If not, I will come to you soon. That can only be interpreted as a threat, says Jung. Christ, as we know, teaches love your enemies. But here he threatens a massacre of children, all too reminiscent of Bethlehem. This is um, in relation to the preaching of the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. He will, quote, throw her on a sickbed, unquote, and, quote, strike her children dead, unquote. But he who keeps my works to the end, I will give him power over the nations, and he shall you rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself has, have received power from my father, and I will give him the morning stir. This apoc apocalyptic Christ behaves rather like a bad-tempered, power-conscious boss who very much resembles the shadow of a love-preaching bishop. And in relation to Revelation, the most frightening book of the Bible, I think, by far, the sixth seal brings a cosmic catastrophe and everything hides from the wrath of the Lamb for his, the great day of his wrath has come. We no longer recognise the merely the meek lamb who lets himself be led unresistingly to the slaughter there is only the aggressive and irascible ram whose rage can at last be vented in all this i see a less meta metaphysical mystery than the outburst of a long pent-up sorry of long pent-up negative feelings such as frequently can be observed in people who strive for perfection for this purpose he had to shut out all negative feelings this is john and thanks to a helpful lack of self-reflection he was able to forget them but though they disappeared from the conscious level they continued to rankle beneath the surface and in the course of time spun an elaborate web of resentments and vengeful thoughts that then burst upon consciousness in the form of a revelation from this there grew up a terrifying picture that blatantly contradicts all ideas of Christian humility, tolerance, and love of your neighbour and your enemies, and makes nonsense of a loving father in heaven, or in heaven and rescuer of mankind. A veritable orgy of hatred, wrath, vindictiveness, and blind, destructive fury that revels in fantastic images of terror, breaks out, and with blood and fire overwhelms a world which Christ has just endeavoured to restore to the original state of innocence with a loving and communing God. So there you go. Uh, he speaks quite a lot about the imagery of uh, uh, Revelation. Um, and he also speaks about, as I said before, he, he analyzes John and he thinks actually that John wasn't psychotic and that John may actually have had visions of some terrifying future events. And uh, I'd love to read more, but I need to read this uh, piece of writing. Yeah, that I'm going to read. We could devote, I suppose, probably many hours to the subject. Um, Yeah, lots of very, very um, um, uh, thought-provoking comments there, by the way. A lot of, seems to have gotten a lot of people thinking, yes, part of the uh, purpose of the exercise, isn't it? We're all learning. Every day is, every day is learning. Um, but it, but, it, but it, I have to find out where this is. I do apologize. Give me one moment. Uh, 
I think this is it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so this all ties in. I hope that you find that this is very relevant to what we've just been talking about. This section of the book that I've written, and this is, remember, this is a first draft. This is not edited. This is it raw as it emerged onto the onto the page from the typewriter. Yes, I'm using a typewriter. Imagine that, using an antiquated piece of equipment to write a book. Isn't it fantastic? Uh, this, this section is actually very deeply inspired by uh, Jung's answer to Job, and I think you will see that. And here is how, at the end of the episode, we tie it all in with Irish mythology. I hope, I hope that the uh, forthcoming uh, makes uh, sense to you in terms of what we've just been discussing. Um, and I will have uh, four pages of, of TypeScript um, to 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 discuss. Uh, this work draws uh, very deeply upon my 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 book Return to Sagish and the imagery contained therein, which was uh, largely of an extemporaneous uh, or, or 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 involuntary or you know um, nature, a spontaneous nature. And this text now is me basically trying to make sense of all that. <laughs> and it's a funny thing that we humans do, isn't it? It's like, this is why myth resonates. Myth doesn't have to have an explanation, just as symbols don't have to have a, an explicit. But we always want the explicit, don't we? we? We want the empirical. We want the rationalistic. We want the scientific. We want the measurable. We want something tangible out of it all. And yet we don't realize that part of the reason that myth was so successful as a vehicle uh, for, for um, staying uh, the, the, the psyche and the human condition against the propensity towards uh, neurosis and psychosis um, was was that it just acted in a way that didn't require you to rationally think about it, you know? Yes, I think that's, that must be Kerem Gogus. That has to be Kerem. Writing a book, yes, it is indeed. Writing a typewriter, writing a book with a typewriter is like shooting photography with a film camera. Yes, indeed. The image of the king, I hope you enjoy this. And uh, this is a, a little bit of me pouring my heart out a little bit and um, exposing myself uh, and my fragilities and the fragility of my human, my own human condition and recognizing all of what Jung was talking about in relation to Yahweh, in relation to Job, in relation to Satan, in relation to Christ, in relation to John, and applying that to my own uh, experience as a human. The image of the king of his own wild nature being cast up on the shore of Brunebonia is an explicit reference to the Dagda, as much as it represents some kind of wish fulfillment for me. At the, as the king of Lin Feik, that's Feik's pool where the salmon of knowledge was caught, Dagda has already charted the untamed waters of his own deep self. He is the all-seeing, all-knowing, perspicacious, quote, lord of all knowledge, unquote, Roa Rofa, Roessa, which is his Irish, one of his Irish epithets who assumes salmon form in order to inculcate or enlighten the curious initiate who is ready to cross that threshold of his own wild nature. And this is where I think there is a vast difference between the deities of old Irish mythology and the deities that I, the deity uh, that I encountered in, in the Bible. And which is one of the reasons that you know, from a, a spiritual and, uh, I suppose, religious, nuministic, transcendental point of view, I found a lot more imagery in the Irish myths that helped me to grow as a human being than I did in my Christian upbringing, which only wanted to stymie most aspects, uh, you know, and to command not to, rather than to encourage to do something. It always seemed to be a proscription rather than a prescription for life. And if I should be the salmon there in Feix pool on the watery verge of Brunebonia, I am only that because the circumstances of my life have allowed it, not because I have assumed that right for myself. One does not inaugurate oneself as the king of Lin Feik. It would be better to assume a condition of humility in the face of greatness, lest one be devoured in one gulp by the hungry birds that would make carrion of our arrogance. It was, after all, a bird who plucked out one of Bradon Fassa's eyes, that is, the salmon of knowledge. And only then was he able to truly see. 
The perception of the self as a morsel for the birds to devour exemplifies the condition of modesty that serves as the sine qua non for an ele elevation, in other words, a prerequisite. Being so devoured, one is then, quote unquote, taken into the sky, so to speak, towards the higher realms to which we have inevitably striven. In other words, there mu must first come a death or a dismemberment or dissolution of egotistical notions or intellectual or logically contrived ideas of meritorious deliverance from the shackles of the persona. We would feign kingship for ourselves if only to indulge in the fantasy of dominion, but our delusions of grandeur would soon be undone by our arrogance and superciliousness. The stark truth of Lin Feig is that we must first be devoured before we can even contemplate ascension. We must be capable of being kings and queens of our own tumultuous nature before we can conceive the notion of sovereignty over others. Is it not the case that many of those who have assumed positions of great authority in the world are capable of any semblance of self-governance? How many of today's bosses behave with a ruthless arrogance and indifference to the sometimes fragile condition of their subordinates, often verging even on psychopathy? It is one thing for such a flawed soul to be in charge of a corporation or organization. It is an entirely different matter when such a person assumes dominion over a state or nation. A vast host of subjects quivers and trembles under the rule of one who is completely ignorant of his own dark nature. And I hope that you can see the theme emerging here uh, of, 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 you know, this lack of awareness uh, that, that Jung speaks about in Yahweh, um, being universal, uh, being something that applies to all humans. Beholding a vision of my mythical self atop Sheed and Broga, I'm somewhat apprehensive about seeing something that I might be afraid to contemplate. Exposing oneself to a thorough and comprehensive self-examination is a process that is not undertaken lightly, nor is it a process that can be completed in a short time frame, if indeed it is ever completed at all. One should exercise prudence and caution in how one approaches the well. The urgent psychological instruction of the myth of Necton's well is that one should not be too eager to look into the depths of one's own psyche for fear of a deluge. It would perhaps be better to visit with a sense of circumspection, to peek cautiously beneath the surface of the water only for a short time, and to retreat in good time before the well spills over the brim. The adoption of a little and often approach would seem more judicious. Contemplating my mythical self at Schiedenbroga, I wonder what form that might take. The idealized individuation of the vision presents itself as Elkmar, the druid, the mystic, the poet, in other words, the one who embodies wisdom atop the mound, something derived directly from the story Tochmar Iten. However, possessing a sagacious awareness, a full measure of the dark forms that lie latent in the depths of one's own well, the observer must be willing to conceive other possibilities. Recognizing that there is a hideling monster concealed within each of us, we might also witness our mythical form as the Mata at Newgrange, the behemoth which was deep in the water and which was slaughtered and dismembered by Dagda and the men of Erin. Much as we might strive towards the light, we cannot negate or obliterate the darkness that lurks beneath the water in all of us. Whether we would acknowledge the fact or delude ourselves with indifference or denial, the shadow of which Jung wrote lies within each and every one of us, even the most devout, even the saints themselves. Both Freud and Jung considered our affections and impulses to occur as paired opposites. Uh, and, and of course, uh, this is uh, stemming, and there are references here to uh, answer to Job leading Jung to regularly use the noun, the noun an, enantiodromia, describing a principle attributed to the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. This principle posits that everything eventually changes into its opposite. 
in his remarkable work, Answer to Job, and, and in brackets I have, although all of Jung's work could be described as remarkable, Answer to Job may be his most important work of all, because it addresses the enantiodromia as it is manifested in the capricious and sometimes infuriated Yahweh. Even John the Divine, author of the Revelation, although he may have striven towards goodness and as an exemplary Christian, had his shadow nature. If my reading of Answer to Job is correct, this dark counterpart of John's seeped over, one might even liken it to an eruption, in the book of Revelation. Jung tells us that, and I think I read this quote from the book, that John, quote, had to shut out all negative feelings and, thanks to a helpful lack of self-reflection, he was able to forget them. But though they disappeared from the conscious level, they continued to rankle beneath the surface. And in the course of time, spun an elaborate web of resentments and vengeful thoughts, which then burst upon consciousness in the form of a revelation, unquote. What emerged was a terrifying vision that was not just at odds with the Christian worldview, but was in fact utterly antithetical to it. This vision, quote, blatantly contradicts all ideas of Christian humility, tolerance, and love of your neighbour and your enemies, and makes nonsense of a loving father in heaven and rescuer of mankind. A veritable orgy of hatred, wrath, vindictiveness, and blind, destructive fury, I read this too, that revels in fantastic imageries of terror, breaks out, and with blood and fire overwhelms a world which Christ had just endeavoured to restore to the original state of innocence and loving communion with God. Unquote. John may have been a model Christian who incessantly demonstrated the Christian virtues of love, faith, humility, devotion, and denial of worldly and carnal desires. But as Jung says, quote, in the long run, this can become too much, even for the most righteous, unquote. The violent eruption of the well, in John's case, manifests with a vision that has unforeseen ferocity and intensity that one can scarcely read it without shuddering in fear, which I wonder who among you has read the book of Revelation and not shuddered in fear at the possibilities. The revelation represents an unbridled view of the terrifying double aspect, not just of man, but of God too. Quote, a sea of grace is met by a seething lake of fire, unquote. And that's from Answer to Job, page 115. To see oneself as the Mata atop Newgrange, the monster, the creator and destroyer of worlds. And the reason I call it uh, the Mata the creator of worlds is because it's a creation myth and more about that in the Bowen monograph, for example, more about that in my Mythical Ireland book, for example. The creator and destroyer of worlds is to acknowledge and accept the polarity the tension of opposites that is within us all. To acknowledge the monster within precipitates the growth of the self. Awareness of this inner shadow endows you with a keener sense of judgment, enabling you to keep the monster in check, so to speak. Blindness to the darkness within us is and has been disastrous for mankind. Even St. John the Divine, who likely strove towards perfection in the expression of his Christian beliefs and attitudes, may have been prone to the, quote, irritability, bad moods and outbursts of effect that are the classical symptoms of chronic virtuousness. One of the most pressing an lessons of answer to Job, which must also be seen as a stark warning, is that the terrible double aspect of the Old Testament God is also present in man or vice versa, right? probably would change that to and vice versa. Displaying a total lack of self-reflection or remorse, Yahweh punishes the blameless Job with, quote, only ruthless ruthlessness and brutality, unquote. And in doing so, he, uh, we, we read out this earlier, he flagrantly violates at least three of the commandments he himself gave out on Mount Sinai, unquote. The faithful and pious job is Job is subject to the most heinous, unrelenting and merciless punishment by a God seemingly incapable of any measure of self-awareness. Unable to reflect on his own shortcomings, God projects instead onto Job a skeptic's face, uh, quote, a skeptic's face, which is hateful to him because it is his own, unquote. Boasting of his own power, cleverness, courage, invincibility, etc., 
Yahweh meets out a ruthless scheme of punishment, or rather, he allows Satan uh, to goad him into doing so, in which Job's ten children are killed by marauding invaders and his livestock and ser servants are slaughtered. Young poses, and I didn't read this out from the book, I left it because I wanted to read it now. Young poses what is probably the most sapient question of the entire book when he asks, is it worth the lion's while to terrify a mouse? Seeing myself as the monster Martha at Newgrange serves as an indication of my own sense of self-reflection, a tacit acknowledgement that at times I am capable of letting my inner monster run wild. Knowing that it is something that resides within me, rather than projecting it onto others, perhaps renders me somewhat more capable of reining it in again. And I hope that has uh, given you some insight into uh, the influence that uh, Answer to Job has had on my own work. Uh, forthcoming, I might add, in the form of um a, a typescript which at the moment has run to 121 pages of typescript which is approximately i think something like fifty-five thousand words and uh hopefully a lot more to come i hope you all enjoyed yourself um yes i think that was what jung was referring to this is the hellenistic aspect as well you know that it seems that uh, everything seems to just coalesce and and go along for a, for a while, and and then there's this point at which it what's the word collapses. You know that the house comes crashing down. The madness, madness of man, tends to bring the house down upon himself. You know. <laughs> uh, Tinkle Tink says a few of my friends drink monster energy drink out of a jug should I be worried <laughs> I, I always say definitely 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 uh, you need to be more much more worried about humans than monsters definitely Niall says that was a very powerful uh, and, and Jungian writing perhaps the contradictory nature of God isn't a mistake but instead a key message that's the other point that that is part of the instructive message of the whole thing that it isn't so if you you see, uh, maybe that's the failing of the church. The failing of the church is to insist, as I said, like the priest at that mass that day, he said, trusting that you are uh, an all forgiving and loving father. And I'm sitting there going, you haven't read the book of Job, or at, le or at least you're, for, for, you're, you're, you're completely forgetting it or pushing it to one side. Or maybe, you know, the theologians have convinced you that, you know, uh, God, as he has taken form, uh, uh, the God who takes the form of Christ is very different to the God of the Old Testament. I mean, you're able to argue with it away one, one way or the other. But is this a failing of the church, a failing of the church to actually really, really instruct you on the meaning? I'll tell you there's something that up until around, I can't remember exactly when, perhaps the middle of the 20th century, perhaps the 1960s. I can't remember exactly when. Up until then, mass was held in Latin, which was not the uh, vernacular. So a lot of people didn't understand what was going on, although the Christian brothers uh, and some of the religious inst uh, institutions of education did teach Latin. We won't go there because there's so much hurt and pain there. Um, you know, and the priest for most of the ceremony had his back to the congregation. It was so cloaked in, in, in mystery that, that actually people were deprived of the meaning of it. Um, and there is something, uh, uh, as my good friend uh, Dolores Whelan, uh, who we met on one of the the conversation episodes, uh, author of Ever Ancient, Ever New, and, and is very interested in Celtic spirituality. Uh, Dolores would often say that there's something beautif beautifully symbolic and reverent about the Eucharist and, you know, uh, about a solemn mass. But I think she comes at it from the point of view of somebody who's is very well educated and you know not just in christian tradition but in other traditions and is able to appreciate it but i think an awful lot of people over the years who are, who are going to church I'm, I'm speaking about catholics in ireland more so than any people outside of ireland because i don't have any experience of those 
the sort of people who came to mass and just mumbled prayers and left at communion time i mean the whole point of the mass culminates in in the eucharist and and yet they were heading off out the door before receiving communion and that kind of defeated the whole purpose of the thing as far as they were concerned just showing up and mumbling a few prayers was good enough to keep you on god's good good side not having not possessing any understanding of the deeper meanings of it all at all and perhaps that is a failure of the church young in his work not just in answer to job it would be my impression of young that he actually realized that we had reached a time when uh, the myth and the metaphor uh, of the Bible is, is not resonating anymore and that something may, may have to take its place. That's his uh, opinion, not necessarily mine. But he did say that he found the image of the woman in heaven uh, clothed with the sun and the moon surrounded by stars as being overtly pagan. Uh, and again, being a sort of like a heavenly image of, of Sophia. And he thought this was very interesting that, you know, after all the destructive fury of the apocalypse, uh, that the, the, the future, as it were, um, came partly in the form of this um, divine woman. And uh, I think that Jung perhaps thought that that's precisely what was needed. Um, because another part of the, the, the difficulty is that, the the, the 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 man especially uh, pertains to women as well but if, if you know what the anima and the animus the feminine aspect in man that he so suppresses you know that intuitive uh, side that he, he so doesn't want to present to the world and i'm not i'm not talking about being effeminate i'm talking about the feminine aspect that is inherent in the male psyche and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, contrary to that uh, or on the opposite side of that, uh, the, the male aspect of the woman, which is the animus, uh, which sometimes she wants to shield shield uh, from the world, is coming to terms with all that. Uh, and that, of course, is one of the archetypes, you know, the divine woman um, who comes, as I say, towards the end of Revelation. After all the all the bloodletting and all of the, the, the plagues and the, uh, the death and destruction, that there emerges this wondrous sign in heaven which takes the form of a, a brilliant female wow what a future huh anyway uh, let's hope that uh jung was wrong about john the divine when he said that he wasn't undergoing a psychosis and that he may have had a genuine vision jung actually believed that and he talks about the damoclean sword that hangs over us all and the tendency you know um the, the tendency towards uh, you know, ir 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 irrational, you know, conflict and warfare, which is so plagued. I mean, he had uh, several visions of the Great War, as I said in the last episode, bef just before it happened in 1913. He lived through the Second World War um, and, um, you know, uh, he could see the, the myth behind it. Um, that's perhaps something for another day. Um, and the whole fear being that, you know, at any moment somebody could ignite the spark that brings the whole show to an end. And does anybody seriously doubt that that's still possible? Do we, do we think we've moved beyond that? You know, do we think that we've, do we think that everything's okay now? We're not going to, we're not going to have another world war. We're not going to have another, another situation in which a, a crisis develops, not just into a regional thing, but a global thing. Um, helped uh, helped along by such things as the, the plagues spoken of in revelation which you know you might say are happening already and then don't mention climate change the monster or the elephant in the room that a lot of people don't want to talk about uh, but which is making itself uh, seen and heard and felt uh, with increasing uh, regularity and ferocity uh, and which is displacing more and more people as it does as it does so and so when you consider all of that, then no wonder then that you shudder when you read Revelation and you shudder too when you, uh, I don't know if any of you watched the video after we spoke about it last week of uh, Marie-Louise von Franz being interviewed about Jung after his death um, and being asked about his uh, apparent vision of the apocalypse, which he had himself. And she actually didn't even want to talk about it. But she said something about, you know, Jung only ever thought that we could just about barely creep around the corner. Um, and that the one thing that gave him comfort uh, more than anything was that in seeing all of the d 
destruction and the, the laying waste of the earth that he saw in this vision. And I'm talking about Jung himself. I'm not talking about uh, St. John the Divine. I'm talking about a, a vision or a dream or a series of dreams that Jung had, which I don't think he wrote about and which he must have confided in uh, close colleagues and friends about, in, in which he saw the, much of the planet destroyed. But the one thing that gave him just an inkling of hope was that there were just here and there uh, little signs of life. A little bit like that uh, floating ark, you know, when the waters of the flood began to abate. A mythology for the future, you know. Anyway, um, don't forget, of course, to the overarching theme uh, of myth in general, and perhaps you could include biblical elements in here, of the lightness and the darkness being basically aspects of us and our, our, our soul, our psyche, our human condition. And the battles that take place, uh, which are projected out there, you know, are just reflections, mere reflections of what, what's taking place within us all the time, you know. So there you go. Um, don't forget that the Mythical Ireland 2022 calendar, I think about that for a second, uh, you can pre-order that on the website at mythicalireland.com. There's a special offer for September on the website. Also, if you go into the special offers, go into the gallery and shop and special offers and discounts, you will see that for the month of September, there's 20% off when you buy Return to Sagish and the two Mythical Ireland monographs together as part of one package. So save yourself a fifth of the cost. Save yourself a heap of money. Go, go and buy yourself a few interesting books. Don't forget to pre-order your calendar. Don't forget to come back next week. I'm not sure what we'll do next week. I've a feeling we will come back to Young uh, before too long. Uh, and if you have any questions, don't forget, as always, to reach out on email at mythicalireland at gmail.com and put your ego into the background. When you're meditating and when you're thinking about the meaning of myth, remember that it's all uh, universal, but at the same time, it's intensely personal. Uh, so what is in us is, is all around as well. And when you dream... Do as I do, write it down. Write down a description of it the next day. I, I've been doing that quite a lot lately and have been having some very interesting dreams. Sometimes they're totally impenetrable and sometimes they appear to be uh, not just plausible, but uh, interpretive, interpretable, as it were. Anne McCallum is saying that uh, she could listen to this for hours and she's now about to listen to it again. There's so much I could say about this episode, but it needs to be processed. Thank you, Anthony. The gray cells are exploding. The faith that Job had is so much different from the faith of modern analytical believer. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, enjoy the ruminations. And I hope that you don't have nightmares as a result of anything I've said. And please, if you are of a Christian disposition, please understand that I was not in any way uh, attacking your beliefs or trying to demean you. Uh, but I do think that if you, in any uh, event, if you have faith in something and that faith is purely derived from faith, then I think it would behove you uh, to perhaps expa expand your mind and explore it a little bit deeper. Uh, and certainly my own uh, faith as an agnostic uh, which still has remnants of Christianity in it, I have to admit, because I still see the preachings of Jesus as very, very relevant, you know. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, this, this this famous one in, in uh, um, uh, Matthew, I think, Matthew chapter 7, where uh, uh, he, he asks, why do, you, why do you point out the little speck of dust that is in your brother's eye when there's a plank of wood sticking out of your own eye? First, remove the plank that is in your own eye and then tell your brother about the moat that is in his eye. It's basically a way of saying you must reflect upon yourself and your own shortcomings before you start projecting into the world. And so it was a, a, a 2000 uh, year ago or, 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 or maybe a bit less uh, precursor to uh, uh, the analytical science that we have today. Anyway, thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. And don't forget to tune in uh, for the next episode, which will be announced uh, in advance and to stay uh, in touch with all other things happening at Mythical Ireland. If you want to be on the mailing list, uh, please drop me an email to mythicalireland at gmail.com. The mailing list is not a, a spam service. It's once a month at the very most. And so you won't get plagued by it. And as always, I do uh, uh, urge you to, to think about becoming a patron and support the work of Mythical Ireland. In the meantime, <clears throat> I'm going hoarse from all the talking, which is understandable. 
Um, go gently, everyone, says Mandy McCurl. Very nice way to say it. Go gently yeah. into the night, one and all, or into the day for our Antipodean friends. I hope I, s- I pronounced that one right. Uh, in Tasmania and Australia and uh, the far reaches of the world. Hope you have a great day. All the very best. Slonga fold. Bye for now. Kolosov. Sound sleep only if you're going to sleep. Ikawa. Good night when it's night time, wherever you are. And the most important one of all, Toga Definitely take it easy.